So now I am recording the YouTube version of this. Hey, Tilda the Wild! It is good to see you. Thank you for coming on. Gerku. Gerku? I hope I'm saying that right. Nice to see you. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about my Princes of the Apocalypse game, which I ran yesterday. Uh, people had asked for people, well, like a person. I don't know. A couple of people have said, you know, it would be useful. We love these. Um, great. What game did you play, Tilda the Wild? I'd like to know what game you ran. Uh, hello, Secho Choo Choo. Sechua Choo Choo. Um, people have said that's great to look at the prep, but it would be interesting to see an aftermath. How did it go? How did your game actually go? So I thought I would uh, do it. I can barely read that light green. Mem Memfer. Hello, Memfer. Good to see you. Curse of Strahd is so much fun. I hope you're enjoying Curse of Strahd. Are you running Tilda the Wild? Are you running uh, live or are you doing it over uh, Roll20? Are you sitting around a table or are you doing it online? I'd be curious to find out. More and more people are doing it. By the way, uh, I would love any feedback on sound quality. How do I sound? Is, are there crazy room echoes? I've got these big doors behind me and I think they cause a lot of echo. So I'm gonna find like a big quilt or something to throw up there that I think will help. Um, but I think this will serve in the meantime. Uh, so let's take a look. Yeah, so as I said, uh, Eric Volgaris is the fellow who made this new, um, new Twitch template. I hope you like it. I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, everything fits much nicer. It's way better than my like black, you know, GIF that said Sly Flourish on it. Um, playing over Roll20. That's cool. I think, about, you know, last I checked, about 20% of D&D games in the world were happening in Roll20. That's a loose estimate. That was based on the study I did a couple years ago. And I bet you, I bet you it's even higher now. Uh, a lot of people are playing over Roll20. Great. Template looks good and the audio is great. I am very glad to hear it. Thank you for, for giving me that feedback. Uh, it's really useful. And anything you want to talk about in D&D &D world, if you want to talk about Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes or you want to talk about, I don't know, whatever big news, Stream of Many Eyes, uh, any of that stuff you'd like to talk about. Um, yeah, it is really easy to play in games over the internet and play games over the internet. Uh, I'm pretty lucky that I've got two home groups. I tend to prefer a table. I've played over Roll20. I ran the game a couple weeks ago on Roll20, and I liked it. Um, but I also have a lot of Dwarven Forge, and, <laughs> and I'd hate to stick it all on giant bins of Tupperware and stop playing. So that's probably the reason why I don't play much Roll20. But there's something about getting a bunch of people around a table. I'm, I'm, I'm all for both. However we can get our D&D &D on is great. Uh, so this is our Prince's... Uh, Prince of the Apocalypse game. Uh, Prince of the Apocalypse, this is a monthly game. Uh, four to six players. Yeah, Grant! Hey, bad boy Grant. Uh, I owe this to you. You were the one who got me in touch with Eric Volgaris, and he whipped this thing up in, I think, about 40 seconds from the time I asked to the time. And it, it, 40 seconds before the first one, and then I got about 17 different ones uh, that he threw my way. So he was awesome. Um, and I'm very happy with the results. We, I kind of nitpicked here and there. I was not a good client for this because I had lots of requirements that came up sort of as I saw it, but he was a pro and dealt with me. He managed me well, and uh, uh, I came out with a template that I, that I dig. So yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty pleased with this template. I think it looks pretty sweet. Definitely better than the knock around template I had before. He is a pro. Um, so I had four characters in this game. Kurig, the dwarf cleric, uh, the hill dwarf, he's a hill dwarf bounty hunter of fire. And we have a new thing that occurred during this game, which is his cousin uh, was kidnapped along with the, I probably should get a keyboard that doesn't have like red switches in it, huh? That's probably next. But it's kind of cool to hear me type, I think. His cousin was kidnapped along with the Mirabarian this ended up becoming a big deal. So I, I threw a bunch of stuff. We'll get to it when I get to like the strong start. But one of the things that happened during this game is that um, uh, a messenger came by and told Kurig that he had a cousin who was part of the Mirabarian delegation. He was a uh, valet for uh, one of the... Um, one of the ambassadors from Mirabar and he was kidnapped along with the rest of the group. So now they're like, well, now I got to go get my idiot cousin who got kidnapped. So now there's a, an actual personal threat. And that ended up driving a lot of people like his, I mean, there's only four characters. So his character is like, I really need to go find my cousin. You know, I, he's a, a dope, but uh, he is family. So that became a, a lead driver and ended up steering 
much of the adventure far away from where I thought it would go. Uh, Hasira, the tiefling rogue. Uh, I was going to put in a thing, uh, a little, a little tidbit in here that uh, Hasira, that a the rogue who stole the dancing dagger from Hasira uh, was seen heading towards the uh, Feathergale Spire. Uh, that didn't come up, but I think it will come up in a future one. Uh, they ended up getting real close to Feathergale Spire, but they decided against it because they're like, yeah, that place feels hinky. And that should, because anytime they hear about a place and anytime it has any remote connection to an element, they're like, I bet that's an elemental bad place, right? They, they, they kind of know. So the players are good. They're not metagaming, but they could tell like, huh. Um, during the game, they did run into a, uh, the, the woman, uh, I forget her name. She's, uh, the woman that runs Feathergale Spire. Uh, uh, there's an NPC. Feathergale Spire might be its own, probably its own chapter. Uh, let's go back to the front page here. Feathergale Spire. There's an NPC. I should write the NPC down because they met her and they liked her a lot. Um, Savra. Savra Bellabantra. Uh, so we're going to stick her down in my NPCs here. I'm sort of adding to my notes um, after the fact. Uh, So she's actually a good person. They did some solid insight checks on her and discovered that she is in fact not a uh, bad person, but she's like, yeah, and she came down on her and another knight came down on two griffins and they kind of looked at each other and they do know that there's something underneath Feathergale Spire, but it's kind of a secret. So when the party said, is there something going on beneath Feathergale? She's like, no, why would you think there's something going on beneath Feathergale? What they actually said is, hey, do you know anything about these ruins underneath? And she got real nervous. They said, Red, uh, Red Lark. And she goes, oh, no, I don't know anything about the ruins underneath Red Lark. And, and one of the characters was like, why did she get, she got nervous about ruins underneath, but then not about Red Lark. So what's up with that? So that was an interesting you know, kind of turn event. So that was a fun role play encounter, but they ended up. There's Feathergale Spire, by the way. If you want a cool picture of Feathergale Spire, um, I think you guys can see that. Yeah. So there's there's the Feathergale Spire um, thing. Uh, so let's. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Uh, so Hasira did not find out about the spear. Ganthelgrom. Um, I don't think any real character development stuff happened with Ganthelgrom. He's sort of happy. His big thing is fire is stupid. That came up a bunch, particularly because fire people showed up in the beginning. So he seems to be players having a good time. Uh, it's my friend Chris Dudley. Um, he runs. Him and his wife Sharon are both uh, in this game. Uh, Sharon has been on the DM's deep dive before. She helped with uh, talking about running um running D, D games for people with visual that are visually impaired uh she's she is blind and um that was a fantastic show uh and chris so both of them are vets they've been playing forever and chris is seems to be enjoying kind of getting along uh i don't know that i you know i'll probably tug on some of his things his thing is like he doesn't like the unnatural the unnatural perversion of earth um so uh I think there's there's room to pull on that thread. And then there's Granite, and I didn't have any info on Granite, but I did talk to Michelle, my wife. Uh, she's the third third of four players on this. And um, uh, Granite is sort of a member of the Foreign Legion. I don't know if that, that's how you spell Legion. I should have spell check around tools. Uh, you spell check. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, I can at least do that. Look, I can. Hey, everybody, watch me um, clean text up, uh, clean up spelling errors on Twitch. That's sure to bring them. Sorry, people. I'll stop checking spelling. Uh, members of the Foreign Legion of Mirabar. Uh, well, particularly of dwarves. So um, she has hung around with dwarves a lot, and uh, he, the character uh, Granite, uh, has hung around. He's an Earth Genasi, 
And um, the dwarves kind of like him because of his connection to the earth. And he is kind of part of the foreign legion and, and fought in various things. And, um, you know. Uh, so I think that there's something to tug on there, too. And the idea that, that he would have interest in recovering the lost delegation, I think, could be, a, could be a thing to tug on. The thing is, they already sort of have a connection to the delegation now, so they really need more. So, I, I, you know, that's, that's something, I don't know, I think... I think there's more room to tug on perhaps sort of like, you know, members of the elemental cult of earth who are saying like, you're one of us, like no one, you don't have any other place, but being with us and you are in, a being of earth. And that would be, you know, that would, that would really work. I remember we always do this with coffee. I have my iced latte here. Boy, is it tasty. Uh, what is the strong start? This came out pretty well. Uh, they, they were enjoying a thing. And then all of a sudden somebody said that the farms are on fire and they went out and they saw these flame priests. It was sort of like that scene in Harry Potter. Uh, which one was it? Four, I think. Um, the, uh, Goblet of Fire where they go to the soccer game and all of a sudden like the Death Eaters are walking around fireballing shit. Uh, that's sort of like what is happening here is three fiery thugs and a flame priest. And the interesting thing that happened here is they went outside and there's the flame priest and he's got this like golden headband with these three red gems on it. And uh, Ganthogram, who's a bard, shapeshifts himself to look like the earth priest that they had beaten down below. And he came walking out and said, because uh, Larrick is the earth priest and this guy, Ember, I just called him Ember. Um, he doesn't need another name. Ember's cool enough, right? So Ember comes out and says, where's Larrick? You know, I know Larrick is here. I see that giant hole in the center of this town. I know that this place is corrupted by the Earth cult. We're going to burn it to the ground, but we want to see Larrick. And so then here comes Larrick. And Larrick comes out and says, what? And he comes out with two big flagons of beer. And he's like, how about we just sit and have a chat about this? And Ember's like staring at him and, you know, the, the, the other flame guys are kind of like, well, what, what the hell just happened? Are we going to be having a conversation? And then all of a sudden Ember fires all three beams of his um, uh, circlet of blasting at granite. And I grab the dice and I roll them and I shit you not, I roll three ones. The odds of that I think are one in 8,000. I rolled three ones. So instead of the three beams hitting granite, the headband mis malfunctioned and hit ember with three d six or sorry six d six fire damage. Blue just exploded in his face. So he screams out, knocked half his hit points off, and like everyone's like, "What the hell?" And later I said that like there was this sort of subtle hint that Earth, uh, I guess it should have been water, but better that Earth was kind of with granite or with Gonthogram and kind of protected him and he turns and he sort of sees this earthly figure with this hood then and, and the hood's kind of moving around underneath sort of hinting at uh, the earth prophet uh just sort of a vision of him as though the earth prophet saw that this guy's coming into town and kind of affected him so that could be a little fun thing uh navy dm perhaps an npc that befriends him becomes close and then turns out to be a member of the elemental cult of earth not a bad idea. I like that idea a lot. Um, perhaps. Uh, maybe he will have an old friend that is now over at uh, hanging out with the Earth Cult. It's like, you guys, you have it all wrong. Maybe another, you know, I mean, you know, both Ganthogram has a Goliath. Maybe another Goliath is like, this is our way back. You know, this is how the Goliath, this is how we Goliath can sort of take over. Um, so they did fight the flame people. Um, uh, Hasira had a fun moment where she pretended to be a flame person because she's a fiery tiefling, and she met with one of the other um, one of the other uh, bandits that were, were one of the flame cultists. And the other flame cultist said, "Join us. We're going to burn this place to the ground." And she's like, "Okay, I'm with you." And she like flames her eyes, and the woman turns around and she backstabs her with an assassinate. <laughs> Just you know, I think didn't quite kill her. Did like 28 out of 32 points of damage. And she falls back and she's got this hole in her chest. And she turns around and she moves it and smoke is coming out of the hole. And she pulls out her blades and they blaze with fire. And they got a couple hits in. So that was fun. What was the, the big turn on that one was the idea of rolling three ones on a circle of blasting. Um, so that worked. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look at the scenes. Uh, and then after that, they got the message. Uh, I did not have this whole warning. You know, I was going to have this whole warning about the... 
terrible things awakening under the earth. I ended up not doing that and instead had a message dropped off with um, with Kurig that his idiot cousin is not really an idiot, like he's a valet to a, a Mirabarian delegate um, got is one of the members and that they you would really like to get him back. So that worked out. Um, these Obviously, these scenes were really loose because I had no idea where they were going to go. And sure enough, when they kind of sat down after the fire thing hit, they were like, well, so what do we want to do? And they started off by, where were they? Where, oh, so they heard about the flame cultists and the fact that there's a, uh, the charismatic, so we go to our secrets here, right? They found out about the charismatic priest. Uh, this one occurred. Um, and they said, oh, that there's a bunch of people going to Scarlet Moon Hall to join in this circle of the moon. Maybe we should check that out. So they started heading there. Um, they did find out that the Mirabarian delegation got kidnapped and had the, headed to Womford. Um, a, um, uh, so while they were on their way, that's when they met the Griffin Rider. Um, what's her name? Savra. Um, they met Savra and Savra said, yeah, we think we saw some skirmishes that were happening. In fact, we saw some shallow graves. It wasn't really any of our business, so we didn't do anything with it. But the shallow graves were here and marked on the map. And, they, and that's when they kind of changed course and said, OK. So they went from we're going to go to uh, Scarlet Moon Hall. So they started off by before the game had begun. They said, we're all heading to the monastery, right? Like that stone, the sacred stone monastery. We're all heading there. And everyone's like, yeah, we're going to head to the sacred stone monastery. And I was like, that's fine. You can go there if you want. That's cool. But then they said, um, no. Let's go check out this uh, flame guy or this this um, red moon cultist or scarlet moon cultist. Let's we'll figure out what's going on there. And they headed there. And then they found the Griffin Rider. And she's like, why don't you come and meet with my lord? You know, we're all water deep nobles. And, and they were like, so best case, we're going to get spit on by a bunch of water deep nobles. Worst case, we're going to be sacrificed to an air god. So they were like, yeah. So they were going to go to Feathergale. And like half the group wanted to go and half didn't. And they kind of talked about it. They said, okay, let's not. And then changed their mind. Uh, they did find this out uh, and then changed their mind and uh, headed to south to the uh, the scene, the signs of the shallow graves. And then they started tracking the shallow graves and they realized that like a 10 day ago, there was this battle and a bunch of people were grabbed, a few, uh, like a dwarf was killed and a couple different cultists were killed. And then they all started heading to the south. So now they basically they went north from Ledlark. Hung around there, almost went to two different places, and then turned and head south. So now they're headed south down the long road, or adjacent to the long road. Um, let's see. Let's just go down our secrets here, and then I'll, I'll mention more about what happened. So secluded monks, they know a little. They don't know what's haunted. Four mortals attempting to unleash the Prince of the Apocalypse. They they don't know that. Thief who stole the dagger, they don't know that. Ah, and one of Kurig's cousins was missing a delegation. That definitely came up. Huge, Something huge and sentient moves beneath the earth. They didn't figure that out. 6,000 years ago, Bessel Major was built a city and a fortress known as Tir Bessal. It has long since fallen to ruin. They already know that. I don't know why I keep bringing that up. Um, a band of heroes built fortresses over the top. I don't think they know that. The Bessel Major found themselves in an ancient road temple, older than nearly 100 centuries. They don't know that. So, again, uh, what was it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, I find that this is probably the right ratio. If we're talking about lazy dungeon master nonsense, um, I come up with 10 secrets and I end up revealing five. And to me, that's about perfect. Um, there was an interesting uh, article that somebody tweeted to me uh, a couple days ago, and it was sort of a critique of game preparation. And the guy who wrote it, I assume it's a guy, uh, pretty sure it's a guy, who wrote it um, said, uh, you know, had really good points, which is adventures are not written to be well prepped. They're written often, and it's been described that they're written to be entertaining, which is true, but I think he was given a little due credit that they're not novels. <laughs> Right? They're not written to be novels. Um, and that uh, a lot of prep is useless. And then he was kind of went through it. And then at the end he said, and Lazy Dungeon Master says, you don't have to do it. But his, his, his criticism of Lazy Dungeon Master was, instead of saying where we should be spending our prep, it just says, do less prep. And, you know, do, prep is useless, so do less of it. Obviously, I thought that was a little a simplistic view. I don't think I just say do less of it. I do feel like I aim towards the right things. But there, his argument was, you're still going to end up throwing it away. So now I'm saying do less of it, but you're going to throw it away. In this case, throwing half of it away. Um, but seriously, it took me like three minutes to come up with these. And they still help me. And these things will still come up. So I, I do feel like having 10 secrets and then revealing five. I don't know which five. Hi, Gondolar. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, 
By the way, if any of you hear or see any weird anomalies in Twitch, please let me know. It seems like everything's going smoothly. Um, but I'm always I'm always curious. I did find a way to mount my microphone on a table that is not my desk, which helps. But I also bought one of those isolators too. So I'm probably buying them too much crap. But it was cheap. Um, yeah, hedging your improv bets. Oh, that is a fantastic statement, Navy DM. I think of it as hedging your improv bets. I am grabbing that. And we're sticking that up at the top of this. I'm quoting you. Uh, that is fantastic. Um, hedging your improv bets. Yes, exactly. We, we build 10, we use five. We don't know which five. We might only use one or two. Um, but uh, having them is, is handy. And they always come back and they kind of help you get an idea of what the hell's going on in the story. So I, don't, I, I think it's pretty useful stuff. Or I probably wouldn't have written about it um ah so the abyssal mirror so i wrote remember i don't know if you if you happen to be watching my last show i actually randomly generated a fantastic adventure or fantastic location and i came up with a buried abyssal mirror of poison didn't have poison uh but i did have an abyssal mirror i had this weird demonic mirror and there were all these dead or i rolled on a random encounter table and saw that there were orcs nearby but the orcs were all gone so they found an orc camp and there was a big crack in a mountain wall and they went down to the crack and they found this weird ass demonic mirror and the my in my head it was it was drow that made it it was part of the old drow um uh you know all the drow old ancient drow stuff that exists beneath the summer hills um and but i don't think that ever really came up most most people couldn't figure it out but when they got closer to it it became instead it looked like a portal on a wall like carved into stone but when they got closer the center of it shimmered and they could see stuff and they saw three scenes from uh the deepest depths of uh the temple underneath uh the uh you know underneath the place so they saw a huge minotaur they saw a couple of minotaurs that were sort of like dragging dead bodies around and they saw ancient construction that they it was completely different than anything they had seen before and then they're like but they saw these dead orcs and one of the orcs had been like severed in half and the idea was like they started trying to get through the portal and some of them made it some of them didn't most of the time the portal just killed them if they couldn't do it so I thought that was kind of a fun way. And they're like, we got to get the hell out of here. It scared the hell out of the characters. And they're like, we got to get the hell out of here. And my wife, who had seen me just kill another character that previous Wednesday, said, yeah, we probably got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> so I was like, that that worked, right? They saw it. It scared them. They left. You know, they got a little hints about things. That was, that was fun. That was a fun thing to do. I really like the idea of adding small, fantastic features to random encounters. First of all, I like random encounters. I think, you know, some people hate them. I love them. I think that they give us an opportunity to, to, you know, again, sort of build a scene, you know, it's sort of like cooking at the table. Um, uh, Jay Gall asks, what are, what are your plans to make the profits more meaningful as the adventure only really has them show up as the PCs are about to fight them? That is a good question. Um, I haven't thought about that yet because they're still early on. I think having them kind of go around is okay. I love dreams. I love secret notes. Like uh, I, they have sort of those those people up top, and I think the idea that they'll they'll sort of learn about them through discussions with NPCs. They'll learn about them through visions and portents. Um, you know, I think yeah, I think that each of them are going to become a secret. They've already seen now the uh, Earth one, right? Like when the guy's head exploded because I rolled three ones on the on the check. They saw, uh, you know, the character who did it saw this cloaked figure, scaly skin, weird glowing yellow eyes, and a hood, and something was moving under the hood. And the player is a very experienced D&D player. He probably figured it out. But it gave him a chance to see him, right? And I think, you know, one of the things about villains um, is, you know, how do you make a villain, how do you insert a villain into a game all over the place and in this case there's four villains so how do you have all four of the villains sort of working in there all the time they're always around you see them in the distance you feel them in dreams you know all sorts of ways they're affecting things you keep hearing their names over and over and over again until they're wired in and so they've written them down and, and everything um you know i think that that that's how i want to bring them in there so i will probably my plans are to bring them in as secrets and then insert them in to the story as the secrets go. I don't expect the characters will see them until they're about to fight them. Mostly because there'll be a fight. And if, you know, if the characters are powerful at all, 
they will kill them and then your prophet dies early if they do it too early then the prophet will kick their ass and then you're like why doesn't the prophet just kill him you know it becomes a james bond villain problem well i just tell you my big plan and they leave you alive so i think hints of them visions pictures descriptions from other npcs note you know captured intelligence that tells them about what these guys are up to you know lots of ways i love just dreams and portents i love that there's like a monument and a character puts a hand on the monument and then they see something and what they see is like arisi flying up on her crazy wings with her spear in her hand and in front of her is this huge you know typhoon this giant you know tornado of of horror that's rising out from the elemental plane of earth is that ben frank i didn't even know you know what twitch is be frank or it could just be be frank be frank but i have a friend named ben frank who's my oldest friend second oldest friend scott makeover is my oldest friend no be frank okay sorry you're not my friend ben frank but nice to be you're my other friend be frank just a dude named frank i have other friends named frank too but I know it was very close. I have, a, I have my, my, my best friend. I talked to him once a week or so. Is the name Ben Frank. And I guarantee he doesn't know what the hell Twitch is. Anyway, um, his son knows what Twitch is. What the hell is I talking about? Villains. So I think that's how I'm going to bring the villains in. Uh, Jay Gall, does that answer your question? Or do you think those are good ideas? Uh, people in chat, what do you think are good ways to have the villains better injected into, um, uh, better injected into our campaign. I think that's a really good question. You know, like I think about Curse of Strahd and like I had Strahd show up as a dire wolf in the very first battle they fought inside because Strahd just likes to see, hey, I invited new people into my big sandbox. I want to go take a look at him, you know? And uh, I think this is a little different because these guys don't even know who the characters are right now, but they know, now, they'll know now because, you know, things are, things are happening. Um... I don't know if I have any other real notes here of note. Uh, Imdar, I did not bring the, the, the Priest of Tempest who has the visions of destruction. He didn't really come up. Savra, uh, I just added. Uh, what monsters? They did fight Flame Priests and Fiery Thugs. Uh, did they fight anything else? I don't know if we had any other fights. Oh, uh, well, so let me finish where we went. So they traveled. They did have another fight. So they traveled all the way south. Uh, sort of hits on it. Lots of seemingly unrelated things that keep slowly or sometimes directly leading back to the cultists. Particularly interesting if those uh, things aren't necessarily evil on the surface. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Like, why, why are they good? I don't know. Like, maybe the earth cult could have some good. The air cult can have some good. The water, the water cult, they're kind of bad guys. Like, they're smuggling people. There's no good. <laughs> There's no good that comes from smuggling people. Um, uh yeah i think we talked about this jay gall i think we talked about this on twitter maybe because you were i think it was you um struggling running the same campaign heavily mod modded the adventure such that cultists have been moving have been around and while in different cities and only got dangerous based on events yeah that's a good idea uh like i didn't we just started with this one they were all level one so i didn't really i didn't really do much of it but i did have hints at the camp that the cults were starting up the dwarves had seen them um yeah, you know, so I did have little hints that the cults have been around, but yeah, they're starting to escalate. And I think, you know, I just, I love visions of portents as a way to, to bring stuff like that up. Um, so the party headed to the south. They followed the long road, but didn't go on the long road. And they ended up at the, um, uh, where the hell is it? Uh, I got, I lost it. Um, it was the inn, the barge right inn. I think that's what it's called. It's the search barge right in look at that so they made it to the barge right in which was a uh shithole um and they found out that um you know they, they they learned that there is a person who runs this place who's a real schmuck they found out that the, the their delegates really did get here. They sung a song like, oh, there was a like the guy who ran the gate turned out to be a poet and they listened to his poetry and they, you know, the, uh, the Goliath played the drums to his poetry and that made his day. So he's like, yeah, this is great. But it was just a terrible shithole place. And he said, oh, he introduced them to a guy who had run the, a boat that didn't smuggle the delegation because they had their own boat, which they got from the cult. And they um 
So he introduced them to this other smuggler. The other smuggler said, I will sell you my boat and you can use it. And they said, okay. And he sold it to him for like 50 gold. And he's like, the problem is if I tell you what I know, and he did, and he kind of told him a little bit about the fact that they were smuggled and the, the Sholar, there's a guy named Sholar who was in charge of it. And um, uh, I forgot there's a vampire here. I love that. In truth, Stillmarsh. Eric Stillmarsh. Um, missed this whole thing about the vampire. So um, they uh, got on the boat and they started heading north now. So now they're heading back into the Sumber Hills because they'd heard that in the Sumber Hills along the along the Deseran River on the western side is a is a like an old keep and that that's where the delegation was dropped off. And along the way, um, they run into Sholar. Uh, who is a water genasi piloting the other boat the other way. And he says, hey, I don't know if we recognize you. Are you new? I know that boat. That boat belongs to that jackass. But you're in his boat. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we bought it from him. He's like, really? Well, you got to join our guild. You know, you can't just go barging up and down the river on your own without being part of the guild. And like, yeah, maybe not. And he says, like, you know, why don't we, let's come take a look. So they kind of latch the two boats together. And he kind of throws it over. And he's, he's got this rough and tumble bunch of pirates. And, um... Was it the barge right in? I don't know if I have that right. So yeah, it's the same the same inn. It's a different place. So that one with the vampire, I guess, is in the other one. In here, it's not a vampire. Uh, yeah, here it is. So um, they... Uh, <laughs> bureaucracy yeah you got to join right you got to and they're like yeah oh, come on over so then they started and then i think the group said yeah we're not you know like do you know anything about that group of there he's like no i don't know anything about those guys and they're like yeah and he's like oh you know screw this kill them so then all the pirates on the other side attack and our heroes attack and sholar hits them with the tidal wave and blows everybody almost everybody except one of the players right off the boat all the characters get blown off the barge with a tidal wave except one so now they're in the water and guys are shooting arrows at them in the water and great big battle and they but they did fight them and they did beat them and now they've got sholar's boat and they're gonna take sholar's boat and they are gonna head to the um what's it called uh da, 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 da. River Guard Keep. So they are heading towards there. So we ended with them on the boat heading to River Guard Keep. They know that the Dwarven delegation was taken there. Uh, the one frustration, and I, and I remember having this, um, and I, I think I have a clue about how to beat it. So if anybody's playing in this game, please don't listen. Um, but I think one clue is my, my wife mentioned the fact that it feels like a chase, but it's like a chase they know they're not going to get because it's like they're 10 days away. Like <laughs> you know, we're never going to catch up with these stupid dwarves. Right. And she was like, I, I thought we might be able to head them off if we got onto the road and went fast. And I'm like, well, they're 10 days ahead. That's almost the entire trip. You're not going to get ahead of them. And she's like, yeah, it's frustrating. So the idea that you're constantly chasing this dwarven delegation for the next, you know, six months is going to suck. So I think that they're going to find um, the cousin at River Guard. And then the cousin's going to say, you have to get rid of the rest of the delegation. They were, because of their expertise, they were taken down below. You know, but it's dangerous down there. So, you know, we need to be careful about what we do. I want to give the players some opportunity to say, oh, yeah, do we want to go down right away? Or we want to explore something else. Like, I want to keep the sandbox going in this. I don't want them to be like, oh, we got to go right down. You know, we got to clear River Guard Keep, and then we got to find the freaking doorway that leads down below, and then we go down below. I mean, it could, because I'm leveling them once every session. So we could just skip the other stuff. Um, I don't know how to do that. I mean, like, they're gonna, they're fifth level now. They'll be sixth level at the end of the next session. I'm doing the Mike Merle's level them every session. Um, and uh, so they could conceivably just start diving in here and we could end it early. You know, we don't have to run a great big campaign. Um, I don't know how they'll feel about that. So, so we'll have to see. Uh, what else? Oh, so the Circle of the Blasting ended up going to, um, remember it's like, what magic items do people want? I think I asked that and I don't think I got any good answers. Um, but uh, Hasira got the circle of blasting. I did every time I say Hasira, my phone kicks into Siri, which is bad because it sounds a lot like H E A S I R I. Uh, Kurig has a magic warhammer. Uh, 
Magic Warhammer with Lightning, I think that's going to get upgraded to the point where they can infuse it and that could cast Lightning Bolt once a day. I think that'd be a cool ability. He's also a sun, um, uh, Light Cleric, so you can already do Fireball. There'll be a, a Cleric that can cast Fireball and Lightning Bolt. But whatever. Um, Navy DM. Yes, it does feel fast. Um, how has it been in play? I, I haven't any problem, but they've only gone from first to fourth level. Um, what I they do have enough time to adjust. These are all veterans, so they're all happy to level. Um, and it's four hour, full four hour game, so they're not, you know, they they get enough time. I think. Um, uh, Elven Wizard King. This is uh, I run a monthly uh, Prince of the Apocalypse game, um, and my wife is in this one, so she's also in my weekly Tomb of Annihilation game. So that's why I'm running both. I have two different Tomb of Annihilation games, and then one Prince of the Apocalypse game. And this one's tonight. I'm just talking about the Prince of the Apocalypse game. Um, magic items. Uh, Ganthal Grom. What does Ganthal Grom have? I don't. Oh, he's got a wand of magic miss missiles. Uh, Granite has a, a glaive. Um, I think uh, Hasir. Does she have the? Uh, has a magic dagger. Mom's texting me. She's watching me on Twitch right now. Hi, Mom. I'll call you in a sec as soon as I'm done with my Twitch. Um, call your mother, everybody, if you can. Uh, what else? That's where the magic items are. Yeah, so uh, Sharon, who is playing Hasiro, is very happy to get the circle to blasting. She thought that was really cool. Like a, a rogue that has a, you know, a, a um, crown that lets her fire off scorching rays. And she's fiery, so she likes that, that a lot. So that's very cool. Told it a while. It says, hi, Mike's mom. Uh, I think, so that was pretty much it. Um, and I think I am going to uh, call it a night here. Uh, anybody else have any questions, thoughts, any other D&D &D statements you want to bring up? Does this make sense? Is this a useful way to look at a game post-session? I appreciate all you guys in Twitch that decided to hang out for this. I hope you like my new template. Uh, special thanks to Eric Volgaris again for a fantastic template and for to Grant Ellis, probably off on another adventure. But Grant, thank you for uh, getting me in touch with Eric to make that template. I asked Grant what I could do better. And one of the things he said is, if you want a real good template, you know, you can, uh, you can use this. And he was right. I love this template. Get a nice picture on there. There's a pretty picture. Uh, I think we're going to call it a night. So uh, guys, have a great night. Uh, get to, hope you guys get to play some D&D. &D. And uh, thanks to all of you who came into the chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, Navy DM, thanks for that awesome quote of uh, helping with your hedging your improv bets. I'm going to use that. Uh, sorry. Oh, here's a question, John Gold. When you, ran, when you run dungeons, how often do enemies in other rooms move around based on what the players are doing? I don't know, Jay Gall. I, I, you know, the funny thing is I don't really run big dungeons, so it'd be interesting. But I, I don't know that I really have them run around a whole lot. I kind of, you know, sometimes I will, sometimes I don't. I don't really have, you know, I'm a pretty loose guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really pay a lot of attention to it. I do, I do think about like whether or not people are moving around and if they hear other things, um, you know, but I'll also build a lot of it on pacing. So anyway, I'm going to call it a night. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to all you guys in Twitch. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, thanks for watching on YouTube and uh, have a great night. <laughs>